in Rana. Well, I can come up with several other examples of people writing into the gap, successful or not successful as the case may be, but it is, I think, a way of approaching mythical literature. And that, I think, is what uh, Tolkien did. In fact, I, I go on and say that you could well argue that Tolkien's whole career was an exercise in gap filling. He saw gaps and he wanted to fill them in. Uh, the annoying thing is that practically all of early English literature is gaps. There's a very good book by R.M. Wilson, a very discouraging book, called The Lost Literature of, Ang of Medieval England. And, of course, what that tells you is most of it's lost. Uh, how very disappointing. Or, of course, Demeter could tell you more about this, what about the lost fairy tales of medieval England? I mean, you've got the Jacob Grimm collection, I should say actually the Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm collection, which of course is famous worldwide. You have the brilliant collection uh, of uh, uh, Jorn Arneson in Iceland, perhaps the best collection of, of European fairy tales ever to have been made. You have the Norwegian set by Moa and Asbjörnsen, which gives us of course the great story of the three billy goats gruff. Or you can have the French ones if you want to go in that and look at Charles Perrault, who gave us Beauty and the Beast and Cinderella and Puss in Boots and I don't know what else, Bluebeard. Uh, English fairy tales? The main collection is by Joseph Jacobs. Uh, I think it was called English fairy tales with that smash hit successor, more English fairy tales. <laughs> but what have we got in there? Well, Jack really. Uh, Jack and the Beanstalk, Jack the Giant Killer, and I think there's another Jack story as well. But you know, Jack wasn't very interesting. So there was a kind of gap there too. They must have had better fairy tales. They must have been circulating orally. We surely have, wouldn't have to fall back on the old chapbooks from which these were taken. But in fact, they weren't there. So we got not so much medieval literature as we would have liked. We haven't got an original national epic. And we haven't got the fairy tales either. So what are you going to do about it? And the answer is, right on. Uh, you could say that the start of the Silmarillion and of course the Silmarillion took ages to, uh, to, to, to work its way through, but the start of it was an attempt to find the true English tradition of the fairies. And this of course is called, well, what could you call it? The Book of Lost Tales. So there was Tolkien writing the tales which had been lost to fill in a gap. Um, you could also say, and I, it would take me a long time to say it, so I'll just, just wave at it, you could say the same about the whole idea of Middle Earth. Middle Earth is an attempt to reconstruct a world which Tolkien felt had existed, but of which we did not have proper records. <coughs> However, we now know also that in his middle years, in the 1920s and 1930s, Tolkien devoted a great deal of attention and effort to the most famous gap in early medieval literature, which uh, uh, Andreas Heusler, the great Swiss professor, called Die Luca in den Liedern des Codex Regius, the gap. In the, in, the, in the poems of the Codex Regis. The Codex Regis is the most valuable and influential manuscript in the medieval European world. It was found in a farmhouse in Iceland by Bishop Brunjolf for Svensson. That's the right kind of name for a bishop I call Brunjolf, <laughs> the armoured wolf, like Philip Pullman really. Um, Svensson, son of the warrior. But unfortunately he gave it, in what I can only call a kiss-ass way, using an American term, to the King of Denmark, who has now given it back, actually. It's back in Iceland. But this manuscript contains the 29 poems of the Elder Edda. If we did not have this manuscript, we would know something about Norse mythology, we would know something about heroic legend, all of which have become absolute standards for the comic book trade. Do you know how many issues there have been of the Thor comic book? Thor the Thunderer? 600. <laughs> I've never read one of them, actually, but I can see there's an awful lot of stuff there. But without the Codex Regis, well, as I say, the comic book industry would be at a loss. Um, still, uh, we would know something of all this, but we'd know much less than we actually do. But, 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 important that it is, there's a gap in it. In the manuscript as it stands, we have a connected string of heroic poems, poems about heroic legend, which takes up more than half of the manuscript. But at some point in the Middle Ages, some medieval vandal ripped eight pages out of it. And those eight pages are thought to have contained the major story of, of uh, the Sigoth legend. Uh, Tolkien instead thought it wasn't a medieval vandal. He thought it was a medieval fan who just wanted to take it home with him. And I dare say that was true as well. But fan or vandal, that's, the, uh, that, that's what happened. And what was in the gap in the poems of the Codex Regis became 
generally accepted as the Koenigsproblem, the king problem, the main problem of Germanic philology. And many scholars devoted a great deal of time trying to work out what had been in the gap. It was inevitable, I think, that Tolkien would have to have a go at this problem. But he did it not by writing another paper on the poems in the gap in the Codex Regis. He did it by writing the poems that should have been there. So he decided to fill the gap. And his filling the gap, his writing into the gap, is the legend of Sigurd and Gudrun.